in cups. Uh, who here has not been to one million cups before? New Year's new this week. Welcome. Uh, one million cups is a weekly event that we do out here at Sweetwater. Um, originally conceived of by the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City a couple years ago, actually four years ago. Uh, they're just getting ready to celebrate their fourth birthday. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to gather up entrepreneurs and want to be entrepreneurs from around the area uh, to get together to talk and to learn from one another. We start off with one business owner to get up to talk about their business uh, for about six minutes and then we follow up with questions and suggestions and discussion about their business uh, for the first half of the meeting. And then the second half of the meeting we do a community question uh, where we put a question up on the board and everybody discusses it and sometimes we go off on wild tangents and have a lot of fun talking about things and learning from one another. Um, the purpose again is to just get everybody together, learn from one another, build our entrepreneur community. Um, obviously there's networking afterwards so you get to know a whole bunch of people from our community that are doing similar things to, as you um, and continue to grow as people. So, One Million Cups is presented by the Regional Partnership at Star Fort Wayne. We started this, we started talking about this last summer and then um, it came to fruition in November. Um, and we've been going, other than the holidays, we've been going every week since. We've been doing really, really well. Um, pretty much about this crowd every, every week. Uh, and we're sponsored by Sweetwater. They provide us the room every week. We just show up, set up, and we're ready to go. Everything's set up, ready for us to go. Um, and then the coffee you're drinking is provided and uh, donated to us by Utopian Coffee, a local coffee roaster. Steven. All right, so how many remember when next to JK's there was this art gallery, and IPFW had a little art gallery in there, and then that went away, and some new strange shop <laughs> came in there. I don't know what the heck is going on there? Uh, I think Nicole can tell us. I can Nicole, tell you. all right. We love you. We love you. <laughs> I have this like total desire to be a public speaker. And the half hour leading up to it, I'm a nervous wreck. And then I'm here, and it's like, real time. <laughs> so I am Nicole Moore Keffer, and I am the director of retail operations for Creative Women of the World downtown. How many of you guys have been in our store before? Okay, so this is a good crowd to um, talk a little bit, too. Uh, I'm technology deficient. I just hit the... Just hit the arrow. Okay, yeah, good. Or that. Um, so we are located downtown, right beside J.K. O'Donnell's. We have a wonderful little space. We have what's considered a fair trade store um, there. And if you haven't been in before, it's an absolutely gorgeous space, lovely store. We have two floors. The main floor is all our global goods, and the upper floor is called our Lotus Gallery, which represents all local um, artwork. And, but one of the things I don't, um, that I think a lot of people don't always know is that we're actually, our purpose is not to be a store, we're actually a nonprofit organization. And our purpose is to train women around the world how to start sustainable businesses. And we were founded in 2011 by Lorelai Verley, our executive director. And um, she initially started with serving um, poor communities in developing countries women who are who have been trafficked and women who went through a major disaster like a tsunami or an earthquake um, and it came out of helping empower the women in those communities um, to understand business better and their own community and how to create businesses to help themselves rise out of their kind of you know struggling situations strictly through the power of their own creativity so in 2012, she brought me on to open the retail business as an income generator. But primarily, our work um, as a nonprofit and, and serving these communities um, is what we do. And so what we did, Lorelai and I, was we created a business training curriculum, which is essentially um, you know, about the level of an entry college business course. 
that's business 101, but geared towards community development and geared towards working with a population of people who can't necessarily read or write, who don't who maybe aren't educated, but who are still extraordinarily smart in terms of survival, street smarts, um, and just you know general day-to-day -day survival. Our customer happens to be NGOs, mission groups, um, groups who care for um, people in these developing countries, um, and not just developing countries, but people who care for people groups for uh, long term. And the reason we work in long term is because we are only going in teaching a business training curriculum for a week to two weeks at a time, but we need support there for groups long term. We are not about short term mission, we are about long term support and empowerment. And so the curriculum that we wrote is called Asset-Based Community Development. And what we do, and the reason why it works in, like across so many different cultures and communities, is because we are only looking at the resources available to that group of people, what their skill sets are, what their materials they can get, um, what their markets are, anything that can add to the sustainability of what they do. And we teach the program in six modules. And I'm just going to go through and just show some of the places that we've taught while I talk. Um, but what we do is we teach it in six modules. Um, we break it up into six modules because the different groups that we teach have different needs. They're at different places in their development. So they might not all need capacity building or, you know, growing their business. Um, but, like, there's... Like most of them need the financial component, how to understand um, costing and pricing and things like that. But we've we've worked in, I think, 15 different countries now um, that we've taught the curriculum in, and um, we we get brought in by organizations who want this component that they serve these populations in in lots of capacities and but they don't necessarily teach or train in business development. And them develop either as a group, as like a cooperative, or as individuals, help them to develop business ideas. Um, I would say a majority of the people that we work with do not make a product. A majority of the people we work with do a service-based business because of lack of resources. And we're talking, I mean, Indonesia is a really good one. We um, were there a couple of years ago, and we trained three different groups there. Um, we trained through an organization called Pondit Kasi, who served um, 160 different poor communities. And so we did our standard training at a building where they were already doing vocational training. So we have the groups that already get different types of training. And so they were able to do like product-based business models where we could help them design and manufacture a product that they could sell in their own markets or if they had accessibility to other markets like Western markets in the US. Um, because they had the resources like sewing machines and, um, and different, they had a, like a cooking and hospitality lab, things like that. But also in Indonesia, we worked with two other groups. We worked with a population um, of people who literally lived under a bridge. They were moved from the government from their land um, so that they could build infrastructure and highway. So they just relocated under the highway. And so where we taught was under the highway like this because you couldn't stand up all the way. And there was no electricity. The the majority of the population couldn't read or write, um, but the skill set they had was ribbon embroidery, and it was given like how filthy the conditions were, impeccable work. And then the third community that we taught there was actually a highly marginalized community of um, transgender people, and they were pretty. I mean, it's it, they were pretty much ostracized from the community as a whole. 
and the organization Pandakasi was offering them vocational training in various areas such as um, beauty care and salon work and so we taught um, just the general business course to them and they I would say most of them came up with service-based businesses around the beauty industry because that was where their kind of heart light at um, but ultimately what we train in is hope and it's really important to a lot of the communities that we work in um, and just you know we taught in Tajikistan but really just um, how you know what it looks like and where to start when you've been living in survival either from just you know being born into extreme poverty or going through a major disaster where like where do you even start and so we just kind of give them a starting point and what we do is we don't come in as Americans and say hey this is this is how you do it this is what you should do it's when we say that we teach through the power of creativity it is and when we say creativity it is not you're a really good artist or you can draw well or this or that it's taking an issue and looking at it from all angles and coming up with creative solutions to solve that problem but it is done in a series of asking questions and so the first day is really the most challenging of training because there are a lot of cultural barriers that we run into sometimes just getting people to engage with us and so we do a series of workshops and, and uh, interactive programs where we get them to answer the question and the very first question we answer is what are your assets what are you good at what do you like to do um, things like that and then the next day we start to talk about community and, and where what do you want to improve on where do you see um, where do you see problems in your community how do you see them getting better and really what happens is they identify the questions and they answer them themselves and we just as we start to see opportunities we can help to prompt ways you know of just possibilities of things that they could do to impact their community with their own creativity by starting these businesses by using the materials that we can you know that they essentially identify and um and it's just it, and it varies so much from community to community um this is the group that i mentor i live part of the year in nairobi and i have five women that i work with um who are all hiv positive and it's the uh, very first group that we kind of started on our own that we didn't start through an existing organization and one of the things that this group became so important as we learned and built our business on was identifying local leaders and empowering them to take over the program and essentially what you want to do is work yourself out of a job so this is grace Mwangi and she is our um, advocate over Kenya um, and as we continue to grow the program, I can see her kind of even taking over the whole Africa program itself. But she um, has been fully trained in our training program, and she meets with our artisan women every week as much as possible. And they um, do different product development, they do different research on markets, they, um, you know, talk about struggles and challenges and, um, and it became just not only that, but just a really great fellowship for women who, um, you know, in, in the particular communities that my Kenyan women live in, being HIV positive um, is super taboo. We don't talk about it. We don't even put their images online. Um, they're very well protected in terms of that being um, known that our, our women there are HIV positive. However, their whole line of products that they create and they came up with this idea was one of the things that was important to them was starting to combat that taboo topic of HIV and AIDS awareness in their community so their whole product line is called why the red bead and there's a red bead on everything they do and it, it lists like facts about HIV and AIDS awareness um, that is 
kind of challenging what their culture knows right now to be true. Um, and so it is. It's really neat. It's really neat to see them take pride in their work, to have something um, really to live for. The government in Kenya gives them their medication for HIV, um, but they cannot afford food, and you have to take it with food. And so that was the other kind of driving force behind that group, um, was just like the survival need. And so they've just been an amazing group to work with. And, and just, too, to see, like, the personal development behind them. The first time I met them in 2013, um, Regina, the first lady, would not talk to me, would not look at me. She's the oldest of all our ladies. It was odd because I was one of the younger ones. And so, you know, there's just that odd, like, someone younger than me as the leader, and um, she just didn't want to have anything to do with me, which was fine, you know, we let everyone come to where they need to be on their own time, and as I would return, and, you know, coming back six months later, she wasn't so much engaging, but she wasn't as cold, and then the next time around, she was much more engaging. The last time I was there, she was the first one to hop up out of her seat and give me the biggest hug. And she's like my grandma, like she's just like my grandma now. And every time I'm there, she crochets me some strange thing to wear. And I, I mean, I just love her. I just love her to death. And it was, and that also kind of instilled in me the importance of committing to something long term and like just how short term does not solve much. It just creates so many more problems than. Um, than anything, but um, we also do an, a lot of the same work here in Fort Wayne. And so I would say about a year, year and a half into having the shop, I noticed that we would get a lot of people in the store that are like, that is great that you feed kids in Africa, which we don't. <laughs> but <laughs> you're starving children here in Fort Wayne, and what are you doing here? Well, we were already like also working with the community i don't know if you know this but we have an extraordinarily wonderfully high refugee population here we have the second highest burmese refugee population after indianapolis um, there are a lot of great programs in town that um, support you know our refugees but they're not super integrated into our community um, they tend to stick to themselves they tend to especially the women um, they tend to work out of the home. They don't tend to mix much outside of their own communities. And so how do we get them more integrated? And so we do um, different programs through Creative Women of the World. Um, this is Toma, she's from Chad. Um, she came to us through the International House. Um, and she's just, she's fantastic. She, she's much bolder than most of them I work with. Um, but she'll come to me with ideas of things she wants to make. And it's nice having our gallery space because we can kind of use it as a test market. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a good experience for her to learn how to tr do things in our kind of market here in the U.S. And so where we started out was she just, she would say, you just tell me what to do. And I'm like, I'm not going to. You're going to tell me what you're going to do. So we're going to talk through it and we're gonna lay out all the different options, but ultimately, I will not tell you what you're going to do. But you have, you know, a whole ground to try things on, and we'll try it, and if you don't like it, or if you don't think it's working well, we'll talk about why, and we'll try something different. And so we do that, and she'll, she'll come every once in a while, she'll set up her things. Um, our biggest thing that we work through is how to price, how to cost out her materials and her time, and set a price for what she's creating that makes sense in the market. And we do, a, I, you know, we sit down and I teach her how to do a lot of online research and she's gotten really good at that. So it's been a lot of fun. And so we do, we do lots of projects like that with, um, and not just the refugee population, really with any creative soul that walks in our door and wants to learn how to start a business because they, you know, sometimes you just got it in you and you like to create things, but how do you how do you make that happen? And so we started offering our business training course here in Fort Wayne a couple of times a year. And it's really fantastic. It's one of my favorite places to do our training is here 
just because of the dialogue back and forth between different people. And it's, it mirrors this organization quite a bit in terms of um, people giving feedback, throwing around ideas, um, talking about different ways to do things. So that's kind of a little bit about what we do. That is our staff. Well, that's most of our staff. We're tiny. We're tiny and mighty. Um, but I have, um, it's just myself and Lorelei, our executive director, full time, and then we have three part time staff. Um, but that's us, and that's essentially the nutshell version of what we do. So now we open up for questions. Do you know where are you guys are located? We are downtown, right beside J.P. O'Donnell's on Wayne Street. It's right by East um, Business ex ex Executive, right by the business store. The city exchange. The city yes, exchange. right by the city exchange. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The products that you're bringing in, are you just bringing in for yourself, or are you bringing in enough quantity that you're reselling to other locations? We do both. Okay. So the store itself carries products from about 48 different countries. So we're working in about 15, and then we also partner with organizations that are out there. We're just too small to be everywhere, but there are a lot of small organizations that are out working. So we do both. We bring, we obviously, we do the store. The store serves as our income generator. Um, but that's one of the things that has, um, that we're really trying to work on, is one of the big needs for people who are creating products need distribution. Mm -hmm. And there are distribution channels. It just, it's costly to get into. And so that's one of the ways through building relationships with other organizations, other retail stores, other fair trade channels, of how to get them distribution. Yeah. On a percentage basis, how much of the revenue that the store generates goes back to the women 100%. or to the villages? I'm sorry? 100% of uh, the profits go back to the organization, the training, and the mission part of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much does it cost to uh, do like a program cycle in a foreign country? We have it calculated out on average, it would cost about $250 to train that woman for a year. For um, one person? Yeah, for one person. And that, and that covers like the, um, the support and follow-up. Um, that's kind of like the broken down cost of everything. When we go do a training, it'll vary from country to country. It'll vary in how big our, big our groups are. But one of the things that we try and make sure are covered is like, um, oh, in some places, women have to travel quite a ways to get there. So we want to make sure whether they're traveling every morning and night, that they're traveling safely, um, that they have safe places to stay, or if we're going to them, that it's safe. Um, also, in a lot of places, me being present in your space creates a safety issue for you, not me. And so I have to be, you know, we have to be really mindful of things like that. And so, like, travel costs themselves are one thing, but just like the logistics of while we're there and where we're working. Um, and so, in just material costs, like having workbooks, a lot of times we'll need translators, things like that. But I mean, it's relatively not a huge cost in terms of like the overall. So we have it down to like when, and we set it up that way because we needed a way to get like set donation amounts. So 250 is what it would cost to train a woman for an entire year, like and cover all for the follow through and everything. And how many are you hoping to train each time you go into another country? It'll vary from year to year. In 2014, we did 150 women, and I worked in six countries. Um, I was in uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, India, Indonesia, and Japan. <coughs> and then last year we were in Haiti and back in Uganda and Kenya. And then this year I just got back from Uganda. We were in Haiti again. And we're getting ready to pick up Honduras. Um, and so it will vary from year to year. We have about six countries on docket waiting for us to come who have asked for the program um, that we just have to complete fundraising for. Um, 
but so yeah it'll vary I mean sometimes it's and a lot of these are repeats so like every year I'm back with our group in Kenya every year we're with our group in Haiti and so we have at least a three-year commitment with them and so adding new you know maybe we only add 20 or 50 people um, some years we are in a lot of places and so yeah, it could vary that much yeah so if I'm a non-for-profit mm -hmm. and I say oh my gosh I love your program do I pay for you then Like if you wanted us to come in, we've done, we've helped nonprofit or we've helped these groups that have invited us. Um, there have been a couple of different ways. Some have enough funding to pay for us to come over. They provide our housing and meals and the transportation. Um, some are just not in a capacity where they have a dime to their name, but could really use the training. And so we will fundraise on the behalf of on behalf of that organization to get us over. We get people donating airline miles. Um, so it, it kind of is all over the board. We have one group in Haiti that we actually have to pay the women their day rate for them to get them to come to the course, which I'm, I'm still not sure how I feel about that, but that's where we're at right now. So yeah, it's kind of varies from group to group and what their resources are. Uh, how do these women find the course, and is there any sort of selection process before they're allowed to enter the Yeah, training that's room? a good question. Um, so it'll, it's all kind of organized by that main supporting organization. They're the ones that have the people that they work with. So they'll, they're the ones that will um, bring us in either for a specific group of people, or sometimes they'll invite the communities in. Um, and um, so they're the ones that kind of choose who takes the class. Um, we don't, we're called Creative Women of the World. We don't only serve women. We do primarily serve women, but we also have men who are part of the program as well, um, and men artisans as well. So, yeah. Yeah. When you train uh, the women on the uh, how much do you plan or do you work with getting them domestic market for their goods versus an international Yeah, we try primarily to get them to identify their local markets because you want it to be sustainable, um, which is, that's just an interesting concept in general, teaching sustainability to a person who's in survival mode, um, very challenging, <laughs> very challenging. But that's one of the key components is getting them to identify where they can sell because we, we want them to create a product or service that they're selling there. Some groups do create products that are like a fair trade type product that work to bring here and sell, but that is not our main goal. We only bring in that component if it exists already or if it's kind of on the road to being that or if that is their ultimate goal. Groups bring us in at different capacities. Some groups that bring us in are already well functioning um, and just need product development or input on product lines. Um, some groups are just starting and have zero things, so we start at you know ground one. I also like end up, as it turned out, turns out, end up doing a lot of consulting just on IGAs in general, income generating activities. So, for example, if a school calls in rural Kenya. I can't go in and do a business training course with a bunch of kids and show them how to make products that we could sell because we have boundaries in the fair trade world about child labor. But if they really are interested in an income generating activity to support the organization, I can tell you how to start a quail farm and I can tell you how to raise chickens and I can tell you how to grow butterfly bushes. And I, I mean, like, I've learned a lot from the communities I've worked in. Uh, so we can, and it's not even just me telling you what to do, like I've just learned all these things, but we look at different ways to generate income that groups can do that are appropriate to their groups. So, you know, like my, my transgender community in Indonesia, not all things are going to be appropriate to that group because of the limitations that society put on them, but they're salons work really well for them and so we geared a whole training 
to that, really led by them. So, yeah. When it comes to a local, you said you do about twice a year locally, about mm -hmm. how many people, and is there a cost for that, or do you try to solicit grants and donations to support that program locally? There is a cost. We, did, we do do a cost with the local training, and we keep it small, because the content tends to be much heavier in the local training. Um, there's a lot more dialogue, a lot more dialogue, and there's a lot more for each person to lend to the conversation. So really like five to seven people at a time is a good amount of people to have a good dialogue where everybody's involved in um, kind of the process. So, yeah. So how much is similar from community to community and how much is different kind of on the ground, yeah. making it up as you go? <laughs> Resources are very different from place to place. Um, and that's the part I love because it plays into what I feel is one of my strong suits in terms of creativity. Mm -hmm. What did you call it earlier? That I could freestyle really fast creatively? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you are agile. Just you throw are. me <laughs> three items, we can figure out something to make with it. It's like, it's, that is my jam. <laughs> um, that works really well when we're talking about like resources. Some some groups are literally have only natural resources. Some like my groups in Haiti get a lot of like leftover donated crap from the U.S. And so how do we like repurpose stuff like that? Um, I mean it. I mean it just varies. Our we have an El Salvador group that they have an abundance of inner tube tires. So there's a whole product line in their store that is made from recycled inner tube tires. And you know, just like creative ways to honor what they do. Some it's strictly left to skill sets. One of the things that um, is pretty common through all my groups is women know how to sew. Um, and when it, so my degree is in fashion design. And while everyone in the world was like, what are you gonna do with a degree in fashion design? Um, turns out it's my sweet ace in the pocket. I can go anywhere with anyone and I know how to use their sewing machine and it's not a skill that my peers really have anymore. Um, so that actually turned out to be a very good thing the next time. <laughs> um, but so things like that, resources, skill sets, um, <clears throat> barriers like language barriers, um, but it, that doesn't feel like really a barrier. The other thing that is very common from group to group is it never ceases to amaze me how brilliant these women are. And I don't care if they can't read or write or illiterate. Like, when they get it, they get it. When I, my favorite thing is getting to the end of a week to a training class where we are actually creating a business plan, um, either individually or, you know, as a group. Um, but they get it. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. It never ceases to amaze me just how smart we, these women are. And in countries where they're seriously oppressed, um, they know they're smart. And it's like they're just waiting for someone to tell them, go. And it's really like, just like really encouraging. From the differences from place to place, um, it does differ a lot. The, the level of oppression does actually have a little bit of an impact. Um, when am I, like, I'll have some groups of women who really will just work hard at anything. And I have a group of women in Haiti who we were making a product. It really took off. I think it was a, a successful product line, sold really well through their channels. Um, we were able to increase their wages and what this particular group, and this is not a common theme, but what this particular group said when we got to a certain like pay rate, they were like, we need to take that back down because when we make too much money, our husbands stop working. So they themselves identified a window of income that worked for them. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting but they had freedom to do so. And so it just, it, it very much depends um, kind of just on the, the status of the groups and, um, and how much freedom they have. Even my trans transgender group I found really interesting because 
they were so ostracized in the community, like they had no rights. Um, so they were they were super hesitant to go too far out into just dreaming mm -hmm. because they just felt so bound by like what their limitations were gonna be and what the communities were gonna accept and uh, that they stayed really tightly within their own community where other groups um, really just kind of go out and explore and um, try different things. Uh, this kind of goes with the question today, but I'm assuming a lot of people have misperceptions about what you do or that there's myths out there or things that people don't understand that serve as challenges mm -hmm. for what you do. So if you could smash a couple of those with us right now, what would they be? I, it's interesting. I'll get people that walk in the store every once in a while, not a lot, but enough that it's a thing, that um, are kind of defensive off the bat about fair trade. As if they got screwed over really bad at one point buying <laughs> something fair trade and they don't believe that the money really goes to... And first, I, I'm always just in my head, I don't react this way, but in my head I'm thinking, I do not work this hard for this little of money to not serve the world. But clearly you don't get that. So like, it's, it's really, it's important to me like, to know my statistics. Yeah. And so like, I will gun you down with statistics if you walk in my store and challenge why what we do is important. Um, the other challenge is, how do you get the community to care about someone on the other side of the road? Mm -hmm. And why is it important for us to care? But I think, and this has kind of been my theme all along, it's important for us to care because it makes us a better community. Like, understanding that we don't just exist as Fort Wayne, but as a piece of a whole puzzle, I just think that the people that I know who are really bought into understanding, or at least being interested in knowing how my sister on the other side of the world is treated and how she lives and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, um, you know, and what happens to girls and just the fights that our women and our girls go through um, and, and just <laughs> is overwhelming. And one of the things I always tell people is let's look at human trafficking for a second. $32 billion a year industry. And I, I think a lot of people think Thailand, Cambodia, India, um, anytime there's a war zone, um, all the people migrating out of Syria, astronomical amounts of human trafficking. Do you know half of human trafficking happens in the United States? $16 billion a year happens in the United States. Like, some of the biggest times it happens are when big sporting events happen. Um, car races, um, Super Bowl is a huge one, um, World Series, things like that. That's a lot of, you know. And so the issues that happen over there sometimes also happen here. And they might look slightly different, and they might not. Um, poverty looks a little bit different than maybe it does here, but it it can still be served using the same principles. You know what I mean? You know, they might not have clean water, um, and we do, but how do we, we still have the same earth that we live on, and how do we act more consumer conscious and, and things like that? And so it is, like, part of my myths I'm always trying to debunk are, it is important that we are conscious consumers and we know what we're buying. Um, there are three industries right now that still have terrible child labor, coffee, chocolate, and clothing. Um, and so, like, for example, let's talk about chocolate. We carry amazing chocolate, fair trade chocolate. We do. We do. I mean, it's amazing. Um, there's two big chocolate companies in the U.S., Nestle and Hershey's. Hershey's is finally, after tons of pressure from the Fair Trade Federation, fallen into committing to the compliance of um, you know, not using child labor. Nestle does not. And they're still fighting Nestle. I mean, it's still, like, shown that Nestle's still sourcing from places that use child labor. And so when we're going to buy a candy bar, at least know a little bit about what you're about to buy. And if you don't want to drive downtown to get one from me, at least make a conscious decision where you're standing kind of thing. And it's, it's those, like, little nuances. Um, same with coffee and just anytime there's that option of buying something fair trade that 
did have a much more conscious um, consumerism behind it and, and making, you know, just a little bit better decisions because all those little drops in the ocean are what create the ocean. Oh. Boom. Boom. So, yes. one more question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are you guys doing from a PR marketing point of view to help get this out there? Because, I mean, I know a lot of people are still trying to figure out what you guys do. Yeah. So, I mean, like, people see us and think retail store. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of marketing campaigns. We do a lot of um, cross promotions with other nonprofits in town. Um, we do a ton of speaking engagements. It is, it's kind of just beating the streets and going door to door and, and just telling people the message. Um, we do, you know, a big fundraiser every year. And, and I think we're, I mean, we're growing for sure. And we're three and a half years in uh, with the store itself. And I think um, the more that we get people involved, the more the conversation gets out there. And literally, if you walk in the door, the first thing we're gonna find out is if you've been here before and if you haven't, we're gonna let you know we're a nonprofit and what we do. So. How can we in the room help you? Oh. Buy chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> just. Sounds I mean, like a lovable way of help to me. Yeah, just, I mean, I always Target. encourage people to be conscious consumers. If you aren't familiar with the store itself, come down and check it out. It is not more expensive to buy a gift fair trade and we're not the only fair trade store in town. It is not more expensive to buy fair trade than it is at a big box store. And it's just not. You cut out, on average, 12 middlemen. And the person that made that, who deserves a larger portion of the profits, gets it in that sense. Um, come to, and we do amazing events every month at the store. Um, they're fun. They're family friendly. Um, so, you know, feel free to come. And then one of the things that we want to start doing in the future is we want to open up our work trips to bring people along with us. And so that's one of the things we're going to be launching this year is who might be interested in traveling. There you go. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So since you travel. Yes. Yeah. Come <laughs> travel. Travel. Uh, 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 that's great. Thank you. Thank Yay. you. Sorry, I missed you guys last week. I know that you missed me. So, what did you go for? What? <laughs> uh, there, the health department was uh, unveiling a video series on the opiate crisis. No big deal. And I was there for the press conference. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I always like to just uh, keep it light with the things I talk about. <laughs> All right. What are the myths about Fort Wayne or Northeast Indiana that we need to squash? We're tired of them. And then what are the new myths, truths that we need to start? Yes, I'll start it off this week. Um, I know going away to school, a lot of people didn't even know what Fort Wayne was. They just thought it was like a small like farm town. <laughs> so once I started telling them, you know, it's the second biggest city in the state and there is a lot to do here. Um, I think just in general that there is stuff to do in Fort Wayne would be a, uh, an important thing to start. Yeah, that's that's still true. I, I'm from Chicago originally, and I thought the, this whole the whole state looked like Hoosiers. Uh, the movie. Kind of <laughs> 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 that's kind of true. But <laughs> <laughs> that's so weird. I was so that's disappointed. Pretty accurate. So <laughs> Twenty-two years in. Um, coming from the fashion world, I can say the very first thing people say all the time is. We have no fashion here, or there's, again, there's nothing going on here. But actually, the best fashion we have here are from the small businesses. And we have a ton of them that are sprouting up or have been here for 20 years. So yeah. we really do have a lot. It just might not be in the mall. Absolutely. I mean, look at us up here. I mean, it's <laughs> 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 coming straight out of entrepreneurship and small business. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Who's next? Yes, please. Uh, going off of that, I think we really do have a diverse community in Fort Wayne between the second largest Portuguese population here after Indianapolis. We have a huge um, Asian population coming into Indiana Tech and some of the other colleges, mm -hmm. and it is a pretty diverse area in terms of that. Thank you. Hey, Jeff. Hello. Um, so we're always 
succeeds as being part of the Rust Belt, and you'll see these news articles written and say, totally part of the Rust Belt. Um, and people think all we have is manufacturing jobs mm -hmm. when we have, I think, a lot of like, service related and other cool industries that are being done here. I think I remember hearing we're the handbag capital of the world as far as like the number of handbag related jobs per capita, which mm -hmm. makes sense with beer grab they tend to be. But those types of things are active and going on, and it's not just, oh yeah, go to Fort Wayne and get a job at a factory. There's mm -hmm. other cool things happening in other cool industries. I also heard the other day that we have some of the highest percentage of, um, or we are an innovator in secure ID, security IDs and that type of, that type of thing. Oh. You never hear about that. I, I didn't know about that until like last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, really quickly when I moved here, this probably isn't a myth, but first thing when I was 18, I moved here coming out of basketball scholarship. My dad says, Bernadette, you know, what's the first thing you notice that's different about there? I said, Dad, women <laughs> Take that one to the bank. That's the first thing I noticed here. We didn't have a lot of pickup trucks rolling around Chicago in the late 90s, in the 90s. Yeah, we were trucks. It's cool. I just don't want to truck. That was my first car. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, yet, yeah, we're still talking about ones we want to get rid of, but either or. Okay. No so rules. One that, uh, <laughs> and it's uh, ironic to be here in Sweetwater, but you hear about Austin being the live music capital of the world, or Nashville being this, and, and I just thought Fort Wayne could be the original music capital of the world, or something. I kind of leveraging all the people that have come to town with Sweetwater, you know, a huge diverse set of musicians and that kind of stuff. And I just thought, is that just sitting right in front of us, and we could grab it and run with the ball, or not? Uh, I, I realize it's very siloed for music, mm -hmm. but uh, but I think for the, the demographic that you know you'd like to attract you know young people with a lot of talent. Everybody's town Sweetwater certainly done it, but there's other fields that maybe could benefit, and that's part of the culture. You know, there's something happening here that's just cooler than somewhere else. Cool. So, yeah. matter you have to, there's two venues being built currently. So yeah, yeah I know there's a lot, but is it being promoted? Is it something that city leaders are talking about? Oh, by the way, you know we're city of bang 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 you know you know besides the burmese population or whatever we're this we're this we're this is that on the list that people can roll off in the elevator speech you know it's kind of what i'm what i'm thinking we do have a nationally ranked known uh, minor league baseball team nationally known public library system nationally mm -hmm. known children's library mm -hmm. and nationally known Hospitals as well, so that's for zoo. 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 Yes. That yeah. zoo. I did say zoo. Oh, you did? Yeah, I said yeah, yeah, top five. Zoo. <laughs> what else? So I think going along with music, uh, speaking as an official old guy, I, I'd like to point out that there's a very active youth culture around music here in the city and around art here in the city that most people aren't aware of because they don't go out and just promote themselves, but it is absolutely there. Uh, so that goes with that idea of, you know, one, one myth is there's nothing to do here in Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. Totally false. There's absolutely a lot to do here in Fort Wayne. You can be busy nearly every night of the week. Uh, but we don't tell anybody about it sometimes, right? I think if you want to start out, we've got to get the word out and everything. So like on doing internet, because uh, visit Fort Wayne, they do have these Three new virtuality stuff going. You see on virtual stuff as you've gone in virtual. You see how these virtual stuff you go on a virtual. You see if I can yeah, just take you in, 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 inside the museums and if you go in the virtual reality in downtown Fort Wayne, has a lot of virtual reality and stuff mm -hmm. in Fort Wayne and everything. They have these new, it's a new area that you can go in over downtown. What they used to have shows what kind of buildings they have, what kind of places they have them down there. What, what's inside? What's inside these museums? And, Restaurants and stores downtown. You have to go and visit FortWayne.com to see virtual reality and see what's going on in Fort Wayne. There's a lot of cool stuff. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to elaborate on what this gentleman said about the libraries, we have the second largest genealogy department in the world. It's now the largest. Now the largest. It's now the largest. It's now the largest. Now the largest. <laughs> yeah. And we have people coming in from all over the world to to be there and, mm -hmm. and, and to visit here. The other myth, and I, I, I don't have this 
I don't know that this is the truth, but this is my my perception is when I look at Twitter and I look at everything online, the younger people now are starting to take ownership of this city. Mm -hmm. For years I worked in the media, it started with PM Magazine, and we went out and we only did programs on the positive things about Fort Wayne and the cities around. Every day, all the time, and now I'm seeing it from 30 year olds and 40 year olds and, and 20 year olds, and it's exciting <coughs> to see that they're staying here, they're owning it, and they're adding to it. <coughs> Yeah, I think, it, oh, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say another myth also that I'll throw out there is just um, active lifestyle. As I, I really see more and more happening around town with the trails and uh, bikes and, I mean, just really more more active um, lifestyle. So I think we're pretty known, I don't know if it was years back or whatever, we had it. Uh, yeah. Whatever. It wasn't good for us, okay? <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> well, to counter that, we were also getting like the restaurants and the and, and, the, and the, the food scene has exploded mm -hmm. in the last few years between the food trucks and now the restaurants that are coming in. I don't know if you have, if, if you go around on Friday or Saturday night now, you don't have reservations someplace, any place that's above like Burger King, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you can't get in. I mean, you have to wait an hour, hour and a half sometimes to get into any place, it seems. And then get up and track the trails. Yes. Okay. I think we should start a truth that we are not technologically adverse. Um, I work with businesses, websites, and marketing, mm -hmm. and a lot of times what I find is that companies don't want a website because they're happy doing business the way they've been doing it for the last 15 to 20 years, and they say, I don't see the value, um, especially high-end websites. You know, what's the difference between a $1,500 website and a $10,000 website? And they could never fathom spending that kind of money, nor um, being on social media. The business owner doesn't use social media of any kind, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, their employees don't. They don't encourage their customers to use it, mm -hmm. and that's why you have social media channels of local businesses that are using social media, but it's entirely promotion, and there's no conversation for <laughs> communities. It's just, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, like online billboards only. Mm -hmm. And um, it'd be great if um, if there was a, a culture shift where people saw value in those things and were using them to interact with people that they wouldn't see in person or, or don't have the ability to see in person. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a perceived lack of value <laughs> for a lot of companies in that area right now, for sure. The uh, internal myth I've heard in other, one of the things I love about one is there's a positive aura in this group of opportunity and possibility. Um, there are certain groups in the Fort Wayne area that doesn't see that light. Um, uh, the myth that no one wants to come here, there's no opportunity, businesses are dying. But in reality, I mean, the, the Fort Wayne area, it's so cheap to live. If you want to do a startup, this is the place to be because I mean, your rents are going to be dirt cheap. Uh, you can focus your time, money, and energy on your business. So I think, uh, you know, I think the myth is there's no opportunity, and the, the truth is that we have incredible opportunity that Chicago, uh, anywhere in California, they just don't have because of cost of living. Yeah, myth, no opportunity, truth, your idea sucks. Dang! <laughs> 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 Oh, I don't even stuff here. <laughs> we, don't, we can't really stop it. <laughs> yeah, because you know the riverfront's coming up too. The riverfront. It, I went to a re regional of city planning lady. We were talking about the riverfront last night. They were talking about the what, see what the plans are. That what they're talking about what plans in the future. What downtown plans about the riverfront, about along the Well Street Bridge. You want to keep people, not the new millennials here. You have to have the like, riverfront. Yeah, that's what you need. I'm here. So that's why. I'll just uh, one thing we mentioned with some events and things that we don't necessarily tell people that they're going on. Mm -hmm. I think there's truth to that, but I also think that we are not a community that is naturally very curious and want to experience <laughs> something new. I mean, I think everybody in this room is curious, and that's why you're here. But creating a culture that you grab somebody by the hand and say, "Come experience something new with me." Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Because I think a lot of people do know there are a lot of things going on, but they don't think that that's for them or that they'll be welcome there or sure. we're more comfortable on our couches maybe. So. Yeah, I mean, more and more you hear about things here. I mean, initially when I moved here, I just said there's lots going on. You just have to look a little harder for it. You know, in larger cities, you can walk inside of your door and there's things, you know, just right all there. Um, but I I would have every night of the week filled up if if I wanted to, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean if everybody really in the community is. said, okay, once a month, one night, I'm going to pick that and do something I've never done before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. An art opening, a music show, yeah. an entrepreneur. So we need a market on that. <laughs> or everybody in this room just could invite somebody to right. something. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's what it's called plus one. You bring somebody with you. Yeah, exactly. That's what Visit Fort Wayne does with their passport, right? right. I mean, that's yeah. the whole point of the passport is to get you right. out and make you go do things that you would But Visit have. Fort Wayne also, they won't like promote certain events unless mm-hmm. they're like continuing ongoing and that like they see visitors actually wanting to go to. Mm-hmm. So I was going to bring that point up is that we don't really have a good community calendar. As someone that puts all of my clients events on community calendars there really isn't a central one that does a really great job I mean Facebook more and more like is is going to become that but I don't think that there's but one the problem place is you can't promote to everybody on Facebook because yeah Facebook limits you from doing yeah it's just like you see certain niches of things like when Bernadette goes to something then I automatically like see that she is interested in that so then I get roped and into going to everything cool. she you goes to yeah. <laughs> it's true. that's been trendy center the community <laughs> calendar problem has been talked about for probably five years now and no one's done anything with it cool. people have tried to do things with it and it either hasn't taken off or they get stalled or something like that I know that there's like the did is working on one for downtown I don't know where, where that sits right now but that's something you it's been going on forever everybody always says that yeah. I'll, no say, one's it I'll say in in uh, Columbia City there's a group called taste of the town uh, and taste of the town is started a community calendar and uh, just getting it rolling and I think they're going to be successful with it so it can work how, how are they doing it Do you know um, they they're doing? allowing people to enter their you know, to tell them about events so, so. Another, uh, as opposed to Josh yeah. going out and trying to <laughs> trying to find each one on your own yeah. Yeah. remember that we also had an entry form nobody wanted to use it because they said it competed with their own yes calendar that they prefer right yes right so Columbia so, City may be different but they're, they're, I they're taking a shot at encourage it. anybody who wants to do that to go figure that out like now <laughs> <laughs> and I will promote it and I will push it out but you guys good luck or just hold it hostage till somebody pays you yes <laughs> I like that idea alright real quick anything that's new with your business any announcements problems questions uh, things going on my business officially starts next week Yay! Yay! what is your business am I, I supposed to know this no you don't oh, okay. need to it's fine so my last day at Fort Wayne Trails is tomorrow, mm-hmm. and uh, my business is I'm a speaker and coach, and I help people build healthy relationships and prevent violence and abuse. Can we just thank Lori for all the work she's done in Fort Wayne Trails? Yeah. Are you signed up for One Million Gifts? I don't know. I've, oh. al- I've always looked at it and gone, well, I can't go yet because I have to go to this. I have to go to this, but... Yeah. Now I can say, like, I am an entrepreneur, so I, I can go, and I'm not missing a meeting. Glad so, you're here. So. Who else? Anybody have anything else? Any other announcements going on? Mark, you want to you wanna just bring up again that the hackathon's going on? Oh, sure. The, uh, at, over at Indiana Tech, the, uh, the lawyer hack is happening on Saturday um, from uh, 10 a.m. on Saturday till 10 a.m. on Sunday, so a 24-hour hackathon um, we've got uh, 35 people signed up a uh, uh, nice cross-section of a few students uh, many professionals in the area and uh, we'll be forming teams and they'll be competing for prizes they'll be judging at the end uh, there's no cost to participate uh, so if you're inclined if you're a coder or a programmer or a web developer or, or uh, 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 have an interest in those areas come by we can uh, uh, I'd like you to enroll. I'd like you to register on our, on our Eventbrite site, but uh, that was that's not mandatory. 
And uh, um, if, if they want to come, about this for the first time, if they don't want to participate, maybe this year. But if they want to come at the beginning and just watch like the beginning, like speeches and watch, see what kind of projects come up, is that okay for them to do? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So what time is that it's again? Uh, Ten a.m. Ten a.m. on Saturday. It'll be so, in our it'll be in our theater uh, area in the academic center. Great. Are you guys breaking into iPhones or? <laughs> yeah. 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 I was done. sure the FBI had yeah. 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 Often is equated to breaking an entry. Hacking also means producing products, um, uh, solving problems, building things, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the definition that we use for when we talk about hackathons. Of course, I knew that. Yeah. So, so <laughs> if, if, if you don't want to be there the full twenty four hours. If you're interested in it at all, or just have like an hour to stop by, I'd say stop by that be at that beginning hour because then you can kind of see what kind of projects people are working on and watch just hack into it and do it remotely. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> on April 12th, and that's a, uh, two weeks from last uh, from Tuesday. Yes, I'll be giving. Up, I'm Elizabeth McDonald, and my company is Verbal Edge. I'm a communication skills trainer. I will be giving the first public workshop I've ever given. And it's going to be at the NIC, and this is new for me because I, I had to do all the marketing and the PayPal, et cetera. And it's going to be from 3 to 5 on that Tuesday, April 12th, with, starting at 2.30 with networking. So this is exciting. Usually my workshops are corporate in corporate sites. So the, the workshop's entitled Communicate to Engage Positively, Confidently, and with Clarity. Cool. So I'm thrilled about that. And nervous and excited at the same time because this is on a smaller scale than yours this is <laughs> stepping out it's very exciting. josh uh, so the donor management tool i've been working on for the last forever i presented one of these towards the beginning is officially as of yesterday online available anybody can sign up start a new account start to finish the whole process is finally done so Woo! officially finally launched <laughs> Anybody else? Um, we have started a program up in LaGrange County, way up north in the boonies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, launched LaGrange County, and it's a high school entrepreneurship program. Um, students in our three public schools and how Military Academy have gotten into teams, um, started businesses, or created business plans, and will be pitching at an event on April 26th, Six. I believe. Um, in Shipshawana. So we got Steve to come up and he's the, the mastermind that is out working with the students. Um, but it's gonna be an open event. I would encourage anyone that's interested to come. Um, there are some really, really, really good ideas that, um, you know, they're not just concepts. These kids are out actually doing it. Um, so some investment opportunities, but also just to see what some of the youth in our community um, are up to. So. And also, I know Mark, you've been involved in, in several other colleges in the region. So, 26th at what time? Uh, 6 p.m. I will bring flyers. Yes, yeah, please bring flyers. Flyer look, at, please look at the Facebook event for Launch LaGrange County, and you'll find it. Okay, and we'll promote it. We'll try to promote it too. Other general announcements. Uh, I don't know. I haven't given my speech about what my business is, but I'm a sound guy. This Saturday, uh, I'm working at an event at the Fillmore on Broadway and there's 10 local bands that are playing in a showcase um, so if you haven't heard that event the, the guy I'm working with is uh, had a production or promotion company called Soiree Productions oh, okay. yeah. and uh, so it's 10 bands that play at the rail my kids are even too old to go to that place so I don't know what I'm getting myself into so come on down <laughs> have some fun with that but uh, the events have been uh, you know the place has got a nice vibe it's yeah. really kind of fun and everything I Usually went to the one last fall or whatever they did the last one. Yeah, usually the Bravo truck shows up or yeah, something like that. The so, there, yeah. so I just, you know, something to do in Fort Wayne this Saturday at the film. Well, let me add that that will include one of our normal regular attendees, Frank Lewis Allen, yeah. performing oh, cool. as Raven Dakota. Uh, assuming his back is better by then. Yeah. That's why you haven't seen Frank recently. He's got a bit of a wonky back. All right. Cool. Thanks. And uh, kind of on the myths, Thing with local businesses, but I've been running a, a salsa dance group in town since October of 2010. We've met every single week at Pint and Slice, and shout out to 
Andrew Thomas and the universe because he let us just generously come in to Point and Slice um, and run that group every every week and just really generously hosted us. But we're moving to Pint, or I'm sorry, Petal City for the month of April. Um, this Pint and Slice has some stuff going on, but it's also look at every single Tuesday at 8 p.m. And um, same thing, Petal City just really generously opening up their doors to you know a new group and new idea coming in and, and just I think it's it's easier to make things happen in Fort Wayne than we might realize it's just a matter of I thought you just ask right it's just <laughs> pull a couple people together and and ask yep and so thank you all right we gotta finish up uh next week Megan Sutton from Norwell and the Mantee will be here until then uh, you can go to oneofmycups.com slash Fort Wayne to apply to present. Make sure, If you have not already signed in today, the computer's back there, please sign in um, so we can uh, keep track of who's coming. And then um, entrepreneurship school there from Kaufman, as usual. Um, I don't know, how, how are we doing with sign-ups? We, we need to pick back up again, right? I think we need some people in the room here to like, go immediately home, go to your computer, right. hit the... Find that link about applying to present and, and do that right then. Yes. We we have to fill, like I, I keep harping every week, we have to fill uh, 50 of these or so a year. So we need 50 different entrepreneurs a year to come up here and speak. It's not painful, right? It's not. Okay, Anyone can talk go. for six Anybody years. can talk. <laughs> more um, painful is filling out the application. Yeah, the application is probably more painful than speaking. <laughs> so if you need help, talk to Steve, uh, Bridget, or I, and we will walk you through something if you have any questions. Um, just, just let us know. And uh, thank you very much. Have a good Wednesday. Have a good week. We'll see you back next week. Yeah.